Good morning, everyone in Turkey, and also good night, uh, Professor Zanmano and the other participants in the uh, world. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Efim Zanmano from uh, University of California, San Diego, in USA. Uh, Professor uh, Zanmano, uh, again, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure for all of us to have here Professor Efim Zanmano for the valuable talk on on groups with torsion. Professor Zalmano, you are welcome to do your presentation, please. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to speak here. I would much prefer to do it personally in beautiful Istanbul. But <laughs> uh, so my talk will, where I have been several times, uh, my talk will consist of two parts. In the first part, I will talk about general properties of uh, torsion groups. And in the second part, I will talk about torsion groups of particular type. So a group is called a torsion group if an arbitrary element has a finite order. So if you take an arbitrary element and take it to the sufficiently big power, you get the identity. Okay. In uh, 1902, William Burnside formulated maybe the first problem about infinite groups, uh, even two problems. The first one was suppose that a group has finitely many generators and suppose that it is torsion. Does it imply that the group is finite? It became known as a general Burnside problem because a finite group clearly has finitely many generators. And by Lagrange theorem, an arbitrary element, um, distortion element has finite order. So is it enough to make a group finite? And the second problem formulated in the same paper, this, uh, the group G is still finitely generated, but now, we demand that orders of all elements are uniformly bounded from above. So they exist the same n such that for an arbitrary element g, g to the power n is equal to the identity. Does it imply that the group is finite? This problem became, became known as the Burnside problem. Uh, well, this uh, the smallest number n with this property is called the exponent of the group. Burnside himself, well, it is obvious. For, for n equal to 2, it is obvious. The group is abelian, and everything is obvious. Burnside himself did it for exponent 3. It was not difficult. Uh, Ivan Sanov did it for exponent 4. It was pretty difficult in 1940. Then Marshall Hall did it for exponent six, and it was very difficult. Since then, no, for no other exponent, a positive solution was found. So for example, for n equal to five, the question is still open. Mm. Burnside and Isaiah Schur proved that if G is a finitely generated linear group. So it is a group of matrices of over some field. Then this problem has positive solution. So a finitely generated torsion linear group is finite. Uh, this uh, theorem had very far going generalization by Jacques Tietz. Jacques Tietz proved that for every finitely generated linear group, either this group has a solvable subgroup of finite index, or it contains the free group of rank two, well, and therefore cannot be torsion. It became known as Tietz alternative. Uh, this problem stimulated a lot of research in the 20th century. In 64, Golot um, constructed Counter examples to the general Bernstein problem. He constructed finitely generated infinite torsion group, P groups. 
So for a fixed prime number p, uh, every element had an order which was a power of uh, that number p. Uh, his examples were based on some criterion of Golot and Shafarevich. So sometimes these examples are attributed to Golot and Shafarevich. In 68, Uh, Pyotr Novikov and Sergei Adyan constructed counterexamples to the Burnside problem. They uh, constructed infinite, finitely generated groups of bounded exponent n, where n is odd and huge. And uh, the paper, um, the proof was on more than 300 pages long and it contains simultaneous induction on more than 100 parameters. Uh, now, an important definition. We say that a group G is residually finite if there exists a family of homomorphisms on two finite groups, such that the intersection of kernels is trivial. It means that for any two distinct elements, there exists a homomorphism that distinguishes between them. Uh, you know, every homomorphism, every projection is like a photo. With every photo, we lose some information. But when a group is residually finite, it means that we took photos from all sides. And altogether, they give a pretty good information about the group G. Uh, the kernel of every such homomorphism is a subgroup of finite index. Since the intersection is trivial, we can view these subgroups as basis of neighborhoods of the identity element. So the group G becomes a topological group. Every residually finite group is automatically a topological group. If this topology is complete, so if every Cauchy sequence has a limit, then we say that G is a profinite group. In this case, it can be represented as an inverse limit of finite groups. If a residually finite group is not profinite, so the topology is not complete, we can consider the completion, which will be a profinite group. So every residually finite group is embeddable into its profinite completion. Now let P be a prime number. Um, we can consider homomorphism, we fix that prime number, and consider homomorphisms only into finite P groups, such that the intersection of kernels is trivial. If there exists such a family of homomorphisms, then we say that the group is residually P. Again, we can take these subgroups as basis of neighborhoods of the identity element. G is a topological group. If, it is, if the topology is complete, then we say that G is um, a pro P group or an inverse limit of finite P groups. Every residually P group is embeddable into its pro P completion. Now, <laughs> all infinite groups can be subdivided into two classes. There are hopelessly infinite groups, like uh, examples of Novikov and Tadian. And usually these groups appear in geometric group theory. Or there are profinite groups, residually finite groups, let us say. And these residually finite groups, um, they appear, if Golot groups are residually finite, and they appear in number theory and combinatorics. It's like philosophically, it's like two kinds of infinity, hopeless infinity, and infinity, which is a limit of finite. Now, and these two families behave differently. For example, the most clear example of that. In 1930s, a new version of a Burnside problem was formulated. Mm. It became known as a restricted Burnside problem. 
it can be formulated in many ways. One of them, it's a very strict and Bernstein problem, but for residually finite groups. Initially, it was discussed as a way to prove the Bernstein problem in positive. Uh, this program was outlined in the plenary talk of Graham Hickman at the International Congress in Edinburgh. But after counterexamples, it became clear that this is not a way to prove the Bernstein problem. This is the positive part of the Bernstein problem. It became so popular that once I have seen a survey on the Bernstein problem properly, and it was called on unrestricted Bernstein problem. Okay, now um, the first big achievement was um, reduction theorem of Philip Hall and Graham Higman. They reduced the restricted Burnside problem only to groups of prime power exponents. But they did the reduction modular certain assumptions about finite simple groups, certain conjectures. And after the classification, uh, these conjectures became theorems. So they did the reduction. Then Kastrikin proved the restricted Burnside problem for prime exponent. And finally, 30 years ago, I did it for p power exponent and therefore for all n's. Okay, I talked about infinite groups. Now let us talk about ring theory. In 1941, Alexander Kurosh decided that the Burnside problem was such a great problem. It stimulated so much of research. Why don't we formulate something similar for algebras and rings? Uh, so let A be an associative algebra over a field F. Again, it is finitely generated. What is the analog of being torsion? Okay, let us say that it is a nil algebra. So an arbitrary element is nil potent. In a sufficiently big power, it is equal to zero. Does it imply that the algebra A is finite dimensional and nilpotent? It became known as Kurosh problem. And it also stimulated a lot of research. The whole structure theory of infinite dimensional algebras uh, wasn't developed as a response to this problem. But in 1964, the same examples of Golot provided counterexamples to this question. In fact, Golot first constructed counterexamples to the Kurosh problem, and then he used them to construct counterexamples to the general to general Bernstein problem. Now, if you want, if you want a big class where this problem has positive solution, so where should we look? Kaplansky introduced PI algebras. So what is a PI algebra? Let F be a non-zero element of a free associative algebra. So sometimes uh, I, would, I could say a polynomial in non-commuting variables. Let A be an associative algebra. If Whenever you plug arbitrary elements for this axis and you always get zero, if, if this is true, then we say that this equality holds identically on A. And A is a PI algebra. So a PI algebra is, the, is an algebra with some identical relation. Then there was a long development. Levitsky, Kaplansky, Jacobson, <coughs> Shershoff, got various versions of a positive solution of Kurosh problem in the class of PI algebras. Fine. Now let us talk about Lie algebras. Well, I won't give a definition of Lie algebra. I'm, I'm assuming that the audience is familiar at least with the definition of Lie algebra. 
No, in a Lie algebra, every element to the power two is equal to zero. So how can we define an ellipotent element in a Lie algebra? We do it as follows. An element is said to be ad nilpotent if the adjoint operator, that is the operator of commutation with this element, is a nilpotent operator. And now we can formulate the Korach problem. Let L be a finitely generated algebra and an arbitrary element is ad nilpotent. Does it imply that L is nilpotent and finite dimensional? Well, the answer is no. Again, the same Golot's examples are counterexamples. However, in 1991, I proved that if L is a finitely generated Lie algebra, every element is ad nilpotent and all these n's are uniformly bounded from above, so they exist the same n for all elements, then yes, the Lie algebra L is nilpotent and finite dimension. And actually, this theorem implied the positive solution of the restricted Burnside problem. Because when it has been Hall and Higman reduced to P power groups. Now, if a group is residually P, then we can construct a certain Lie algebra. Uh, you know, Lie algebras were introduced by Sophus Lie in, um, they correspond to Lie groups. If a group is residually P, then again, you have some kind of Lie correspondence. It's not as good as uh, the initial correspondence of Sophus Lie. In this way, you lose from a lot of information. You cannot recover the group G by this Lie algebra. And this Lie algebra is over a finite field, but um, using this theorem and using this correspondence, the group theory problem was solved. Now, what is a PI algebra? What is the Lie algebra for Lie algebras? Again, we take a non-zero element of the free Lie algebra, and we say that it is identically zero on the Lie algebra L if whichever elements you plug in, you always get zero. This is the a recent theorem that was published recently. And this is the most general um, positive result in the direction of Korosh problem for Lie algebras with quite a complicated proof. Let L be a finitely generated Lie algebra. Suppose that it is PI. And I even, I'm not asking that an arbitrary element be adnilpotent. No only commutators and generators. And that is enough to say that L is nilpotent. Now let's talk about groups. Let F sub M be, I have some chats, okay, no. Uh, uh, let F sub M be the free group in M free generators. It is easy to show that for an arbitrary prime number P, it is residually P. Okay. If it is residually P, then we can consider its pro P completion. And it is called the free pro P group. Because an arbitrary mapping of the free generators, X1, X2, and so on, into an arbitrary pro P group, uniquely extends to a continuous homomorphism from this group to the, to the proper group. So it deserves this name. We say that a proper group is PI if there exists a non-identical element of the free proper group such that whenever you plug arbitrary elements, you get one. If a proper group is Pi, then the corresponding Lie algebra is also Pi. The reverse is not true. And from the previous theorem, it follows that if G is a finitely generated residually P group, 
which is torsion. It's like in Golot's example. But now we assume that the pro p completion is pi, then the group is finite. So this is the most general positive part of the Burnside problem. Okay, now I will talk about a particular class of groups. And this is a joint work with Oksana Bezushchak and Anatoly Petrovchuk, both from Kiev, Ukraine. So all, the, all new theorems that I formulate in this section are joint theorems. In case I forgot to say it, I'm saying it. Okay. Let F be an associative community ring with, with an identity. Let V be an affine algebraic variety over F. So we consider the polynomial algebra, we consider some ideal, and we consider the set of all zeros of that ideal. This factor algebra is called the algebra of polynomial or regular functions on this affine variety. No, uh, this case, uh, you, you, we usually get reduced algebras, the algebras without nilpotent elements, but I can see the arbitrary finitely generated algebras. It also makes big sense in algebraic geometry. So the group of automorphisms of this finitely generated commutative algebra is called the group of polynomial automorphisms of the fine variety. And the group of all derivations of this algebra is called the Lie algebra of vector fields on this affine variety. For some reason, if V is an irreducible variety, well, in which case A is a domain, then we can consider the field of fractions. And oh, yes, and the group of automorphisms of that field is called the group of birational automorphisms of the affine variety, and the group of derivations of that field is called the Lie algebra of birational vector fields. Of particular interest is the case when the algebra is the polynomial algebra over field, the field of complex numbers. Then the group of uh, birational um, automorphisms is a famous celebrated Cremona group, and the group of automorphisms is a polynomial Cremona group, and we can consider Cremona Lie algebras and so on. Um, this algebra of, auto, of polynomial automorphisms, generally speaking, is not linear. It's not difficult to prove. It's not embeddable into any matrices. Uh, but it is kind of next to linear groups. There is a class of linear groups, and then there is a class well, they all can be realized as groups of automorphisms of some finitely generated commutative algebra. So this is a bigger class. And this, these groups are not linear. And uh, there is an old uh, program that attracted a lot of attention that started, that is certainly older than me. Uh, the program to extend theorems for linear groups to groups of polynomial automorphisms. So which properties of linear groups extend to groups of polynomial automorphisms? Well, for example, explicitly, this program was formulated by Jean-Pierre Serbe. It existed before. I will mention some highlights of this program. Well, there is a famous theorem 
of Jordan about linear groups. It says that all finite subgroups of the general linear groups, all finite groups of matrices um, have an abelian subgroup and the index is bounded in terms of the size of matrices. In, if we want to extend it to this algebra, it would say that finite subgroups of this group have an abelian subgroup and the index is bounded in terms of this algebra. In this generality, this is an open problem. It is not known. There were important uh, results in this direction due to Popov, Zarkin, Prokhorov, Shramov, uh, Birkar, et al, et al. So in full generality, it is not, it is still open. Again, Jean-Pierre Serre classified finite subgroups of the Cremona group by rational automorphisms in two variables. Another problem, well, you know, for linear groups, there is a very important result, Tietz's alternative, which is a generalization of Bernstein's theorem on Torsion groups. In 2011, Kantat proved Tietz's alternative for Cremona group again in two variables. So the first theorem that I will formulate, it's a new theorem, is the extension of the result of Burnside and Schuh on torsion groups. Let A be a finitely generated associative commutative F algebra. And unfortunately, I have to make an assumption that it does not have additive torsion. So in some way, we talk only about zero characteristic. Let G be a torsion subgroup of the automorphism group. Then the group G is locally finite. Corollary, the first. If A is the polynomial algebra, so Jordan theorem holds. If we have a locally finite uh, subgroup in a group which has Jordan property, then it has an abelian subgroup of finite index. And the second corollary, that if A is a finitely generated ring, so it is kind of finite dimensional all the integers, then every torsion group is not only locally finite, it is finite. In fact, this assertion follows from the result of Prokhorov, Shramov, and Berkar. But uh, this proof is extremely complicated, and our proof takes two pages. Now, some open questions. What about prime characteristic? More generally, I talked about property groups with identity above. No, in these groups, there are natural property subgroups, like Silo subgroup. Uh, do they satisfy property identity? If that is the case, that would do it for prime characteristic. And in any case, that would have many consequences. Mm, if you consider automorphism of infinite series, the answer is no. It does not satisfy any proper identity. But of polynomials, it would be interesting even to do it positively under the assumption of Jacobian conjecture. Okay, now let's talk about Lie algebras and about uh, vector fields on these affine varieties. If you have an algebra A, a derivation is said to be locally nilpotent if for an arbitrary element, a sufficiently big power of the derivation kills that element. So if you apply this derivation sufficiently many times, you get zero. But of course, how many times should depend on the element. A motivation, if the characteristic is zero, 
then you can take exponents of local linear potent derivations and get automorphisms. Now, the algebra of all derivations of polynomial algebra, so-called polynomial cremonally algebra, is a very well-known algebra. It's one of the algebras of Cartan type, uh, described by Eli Cartan in a different context. Now let L be a Lie algebra that consists only of local linear potent derivations. You see, it's kind of analog of a Toshin subgroup. Uh, this, the following question has been around for quite a while. Is this Lie algebra local linear potent? This is also a part of the above mentioned program because it extends the classical angle theorem. In 2017, Petrovchuk and Sisak proved it, well, under some additional condition. And last year, Skutin proved it uh, for the case of the polynomial algebra over the over field of zero characteristic. Now, the theorem. Let A be a finitely generated commutative algebra over an associative commutative ring. Here, no restrictions on characteristic. Let L be a Lie algebra of derivations that consists of locally nilpotent derivation. Then, yes, this Lie algebra is locally nilpotent. The assumptions on finite generation in, of, of Lie algebras in theorems three and four are essential. There are counterexamples. No. Uh, the assumptions on finite generation of the, of the associative algebra A are essential. There are examples of, if you consider the algebra of polynomials and countably many variables, it has an infinite dimensional non nilpotently algebra of derivations, and all derivations are locally nilpotent. It also comes from Golot's examples. Now, be rational vector fields. Let A be a commutative domain. Let K be a field of fractions. Then, of course, every derivation of the algebra A can be extended to a derivation of, of the field K. So you have this inclusion. Uh, theorem five. Let A be a commutative domain. Now we don't assume that it is finitely generated. Let K be a field of fractions. Let L be a Lie algebra that consists of locally nilpotent derivations. And now we weaken the assumption on finite generation as follows. We demand that this dimension is finite. If A is finitely generated, then it holds automatically. And in this case, the Lie algebra, the Lie ring L is locally nilpotent. And from this extension, we can get uh, the theorem for birational vector fields. Let A be a finitely generated domain. L is uh, Lie algebra of that consists of locally nilpotent derivations. Then L is locally nilpotent. We apply this theorem to K. And K is not finitely generated. Now, we could consider non-commutative versions of the above theorems. One way to extend the results of polynomials to non-commutative context is to move to PI algebras. I already talked a lot about it. And yes, theorems three, four, and five all hold for PI algebras. I did not mention them separately, just the same theorems. But instead of commutative algebras, we can see the PI algebras, the same ideas of the proofs. Basically, I finished. Thank you.
I would like to thank Professor Zalmanov for his valuable talk. Is there any comment? Yeah, there is no comment. Thank you again, Professor Zalmanov. Thank you uh, for now, your patience. Thank you. Uh, please uh, stop your screen sharing. Yes, stop sharing the screen. Thank you. Done. Yes. Now uh, we will continue with the next talk uh, moderated by my college Hande Uslu. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have uh, we have time. Uh, we have a uh, 20 minutes break for the next section. Thank you again. <laughs>